Thank you very much, Barbara, and welcome everybody to this session. Um, hope you've enjoyed the session so far as part of the conference. This session is slightly different in that we've got quite a, a large panel. You'll have seen some of the names already. I'm not going to go and introduce them specifically myself because, like making any significant change, time is of the essence. So I'm going to ask my colleagues that are here on the panel to introduce themselves one at a time and to set the stall out and tell us who they are and their particular take on this, this wide and varied subject that goes around uh, impact investment and, and making a, a difference. So I'm going to come to each of them in turn. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to pose a couple of questions for them and the whole thing we can wrap up um, in about about an hour, I would say. But if I could, I'd like firstly like to come to uh, my, my friend and colleague, Alistair Davis. David, Alistair, would you like to kind of tell us who you are and a little bit about your thoughts on the world of impact investment? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks, Bob, uh, for that introduction. Uh, it's good to be with everybody uh, this afternoon and to have the opportunity to share a few thoughts about the impact investment marketplace in Scotland and beyond. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I have the pleasure of being the Chief Executive of Social Investment Scotland. And Social Investment Scotland are the largest social investor in Scotland and indeed now one of the largest right across the UK. This year, we actually celebrate our 20th anniversary as an organisation, which is a really important milestone for us. And for those of the, you that might have had the opportunity to have a look at our impact report that we published uh, just a couple of weeks ago, you'll have seen that as part of that milestone uh, of 20 years in, in existence, we have also passed the very significant milestone of having invested £100 million in charities and social enterprises right across Scotland and beyond. Uh, that's to 450 organisations and is primarily debt to charities and social enterprises. However, the Social Investment Scotland Group also includes our impact investment subsidiary, SIS Ventures, which makes investments of equity into what we call mission-driven businesses, and that's very much a growing part of the group. Our strategy at Social Investment Scotland is entitled Building an Impact Economy. And over the next 10 years, and we're about 18 months into that strategy, we very much want to see Scotland's economy transformed into an impact economy. And what we mean by that is that social and environmental impact is a factor in decisions that are taken right across the economy. And what we want to see from that impact economy is consumers having the opportunity to purchase products and services from social enterprises, for governments and corporates to have the opportunity to procure products and services from social enterprises, and also that investors have the opportunity to make their capital work for social and environmental return by investing in charities and social enterprises. At CIS, our role is to provide the support, connections and inspiration right across that impact economy by supporting those uh, enterprises to fulfil those objectives, but most importantly by providing them with the investment from a variety of different sources that they can use to further their own mission. And particularly in the con context of COP26 and the interest that there is obviously in the transition to net zero, I'm pleased to confirm that before Christmas time, we will be launching a new circular economy fund in partnership with Zero Waste Scotland that will provide investment into charities and social enterprises that want to invest in activity that will support that transition. The session today is obviously uh, entitled uh, Lip Service or Radical Change. And I was reflecting upon that as I was preparing for the session. Certainly at Social Investment Scotland, this is not lip service. We have a deep and long-standing commitment to impact investment, and that is an unwavering commitment that will not change in the future. And then also reflecting on uh, what is working and perhaps what is not working quite as well um, as we uh, strive to fulfil our own strategy, but also the wider objectives uh, of an impact economy. What is undoubtedly working is the progress that we have seen over the last 20 years. I think it is interesting in particular to note that the last 12 months, the year to March 2021, was a record year for CIS. We invested more money than ever before, and that was despite the background of a global pandemic. 
But what also supports that is the tightness and the closeness of the ecosystem in which we operate. Uh, and there are many colleagues and partner organisations on this panel today who we work closely with and will continue to do so. But what is perhaps not working well, uh, and perhaps my parting comment before finishing up, is making sure that our partners and colleagues within the Scottish Government are engaged with this agenda as they could and should be. We hear much rhetoric about a well-being economy and moving towards economic transformation. But it is interesting to note for me that as part of the most recently established Council for Economic Transformation, that there is no direct representation from the social enterprise sector or indeed from the wider third sector, which I believe undermines the contribution that this movement can make to economic transformation going forward. So I'll finish up there, Bob. Excellent. Thank you for that, Alistair. Thank you for ending on such a controversial note at the end there. That's got the people interested and in thinking about, well, what does that mean? But actually, congratulations uh, in terms of what you and the organisation and the team have achieved thus far. I mean, £100 million is, is actually a significant amount given the nature of the and the number of organisations that you continue to help. And, and, and good on you for the work of the last 12 months as well in terms of of accelerating rather than decelerating, given the challenges that you've faced. We will come back to you, Alistair. Thank you for that. I'd like to move on now to uh, another element of the investment kind of world. Um, and Bob, Bob here. Thanks, Bob. Um, yes, I'm Bob here. Uh, I re represent a business called Casanova Capital, um, which is a wealth manager that's been here in Edinburgh for uh, 30 years or so but is nowadays part of the Schroders uh, PLC, which is a very large asset manager um, spanning you know, most of the countries around the globe and well over £600 billion um, of investment. You might say, well, what's that got to do with what we're talking about today? But actually, um, asset owners in the form of people like Schroders, people like Casanov Capital, who are custodians of money investment for private individuals, for institutions, for charities, um, have a big part to play in unlocking um, financing for a lot of the a lot of the areas that we're talking about, um, particularly in terms of making an impact. Now, perhaps slightly controversially, we we look at it in a slightly different way, um, partly because um, the UN has given us since 2016 a very helpful way of looking at it all. Um, and laying down 17 sustainable development goals. Now, impact therefore can be made which benefits both people and the planet, and predominantly um, those 17 sustainable development goals actually give us a little bit of a chart um, to compare uh, uh, performance against and also really what people are trying to do. So I, I'm part of an organization uh, that effectively looks at itself as a responsible asset owner on behalf of others, and our purpose is to accelerate positive change. There's a lot of talk about asset management firms, uh, investment managers, um, uh, looking at opportunities around the world, which are very high level um, and are invested in public markets. Um, but uh, in the industry, there's starting to be a growing conversation led by more enlightened organizations like Casanova Capital, um, about um, trying to get um, financing and to make investment opportunities available, um, which will benefit both people and the planet. Um, some of you may have seen some of the conferences we've done in the past. Some of you may be aware that Schroders owns the biggest um, uh, impact investor in the world in the form of Blue Orchard Finance, which uh, has invested about $8 billion dollars around 90 emerging market countries around the world since 2001. So it's big picture stuff. There's you know, big numbers getting thrown around there, etc. How does that benefit us here in Scotland? Well, to me, I think some of the issues that we have in Scotland are things that we are trying to help with. We need to be able to clearly define what we mean by impact investment. We need to take it out of being uh, effectively some kind of niche that is for people who are uh, either uh, extremely socially aware and have a very high level of social conscience um, or for individuals who wish to invest 
um, in order, or, or frankly, um, give money away in order to try and benefit social enterprise. And we need to try and encourage um, backing the backing of social enterprise, um, uh, whether it is through debt for social enterprises, as Alistair mentioned before, whether it's filling the gap that is not possible to fill from governments alone um, in order to provide sustainable and high impact housing, whether it's supporting social in outcome contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot that the asset management industry can do, but there are some barriers in place and there's a lot um, that our clients, who just happen to be wealthy individuals, many of whom with a very serious social conscience, so there's a lot that our clients can do, and we are seeking uh, uh, ways of trying to connect up investment opportunities with individuals. Now, there's some regulatory barriers to that, which we need to try and break down. And obviously, the, the, you know, at the end of the day, it is quite tricky for individuals to detach making a sensible return from making an impact. So we need to change the dialogue and measure performance in different ways. We actually are firm believers that there is an additional dimension coming, um, which is all about making an impact. It used to be about getting a return. When, if anyone thinks about how their pension fund or their investments are organized, it was all about return. Then I think in the last few decades, it became about getting a risk adjusted return was the sort of talk. And this additional dimension now all across the asset management is about making an impact. But we need to make sure that we make an impact right here in Scotland. Bob, thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, yeah, I know how sincerely we've talked about this in the past about uh, joining the yes. dots and, and actually making it more of a normal part of, of tapping into the world of, of asset ownership and asset investment. And how do we deploy some yep. of that into areas that are not felt to be niche and conscious driven, but are actually become a routine part of, of a portfolio of investments that, that can make a big difference. So yep. thank you for that, Bob. In thirdly, Kerry. Now, Kerry, I'm not going to ask you to, to come up with numbers that are increasingly bigger, as we've seen with Alistair and Bob, but it'd be lovely to hear your perspective on this world. I'll try not to, Bob. Thanks very much. Um, so I am Director of Growth Investments at Scottish Enterprise. I think everybody in the call will know who Scottish Enterprise are. So the role that, that my team plays in the early stage, uh, mainly on the, the commercial investment side, uh, mainly equity. Um, Using just a couple of numbers just to get set the scene just a little bit, Bob. So um, last financial year invested seventy eight million, and um, so we we deal with 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 hundreds of, of companies, hundreds of investors. We've got a portfolio of three hundred forty uh, companies at, at the moment. Uh, so we're one of the most active investors in in Scotland, also the private sector, which who are very much our lead. But that does mean that we see a lot, and we see a lot of what happens and what people are thinking and the, the, the mood and the change. And also, we feel we've got a very strong role in, in influencing that as well from the public sector. So what, what we absolutely do see is, is a change in, maybe it's from a lip service to, to more radical, um, as the, the kind of topic is here. But certainly, you know, there's very much a strong business case for thinking about much more than the financials. Whether that is that just profit built to performance now can definitely be seen as stronger with a kind of social or you know a, a, a environmental angle and things. But there's definitely kind of moral cases and environmental cases that, that flow into that. So we're, we're definitely seeing a, a move um, from companies themselves uh, and especially from from investors too. So there's a, there's a drive, there's increasing awareness overall. There's a drive for people on an individual level as well to want to see action being taken within companies and within um, investments that, that organisations make. And there's been a hold of announcements you know, over the, the last year, uh, you know, PwC, for example, bringing in you know, literally thousands of staff over the next two few years, particularly to focus on, on ESG. So there's no doubt that there's a, a focus on it, an increasing focus on it, and it's definitely going to get to a point where there's nowhere else to go. You know, it can't be um, lip service, it can't be a greenwashing when it comes to the, the environmental side. So we're, I'm very confident that we're moving in a direction which is, is a good one to make sure that um, socially and environmentally responsible investment is, is taking place in Scotland, which is obviously our, our kind of key focus and, and our key interest. From a Swiss enterprise point of view, 
we do have what we call our, our net zero framework for action and we set our ambitions in there. So it's around uh, ensuring that we can support companies and seeing opportunities for them to make a difference and ensuring that we can support them and hopefully do a bit of a lead and a bit of influence through um, uh, incentivising some of that change as well, some of the support they provide, whether it's financial or kind of wraparound advice. And, and to ensure it's in a, in, a, in a just way, which is certainly one of the things you hear from government and, and likewise we, we follow that principle that we want to transition ourselves to a much better economy, but it needs to benefit everybody across the whole economy, so it needs to be just and, and supported um, across the piece. And as an organisation, you know, we're very much aiming towards you know, being a net zero agency as well to show that we can lead from, from the front. Uh, so there's a question over kind of lip service or, or radical. I think there has been a lot of lip service today. I, there's kind of no doubt you, you can see that. Um, but I do think there's a change and I think it's going to happen like, uh, a lot quicker now than we've seen over the, the last while. And we're certainly there with others that you people on this call to ensure that we can lead from the front and hopefully bring our economy um, alongside. Thank you, Kerry, and thank you for that kind of optimistic outlook and the upbeat note and that honesty about the fact that we've perhaps in the past perhaps had a little bit of lip service and a little bit of kind of superficiality. So let me take you on now to somebody who's involved in long term, deep investments that are going to make social difference. David, can I ask you to introduce yourself, please? Uh, thanks, Bob, um, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, delighted to be to be part of this session today. Um, I'm David Ritchie. Um, I'm Executive Director for Partnerships and Engagement at the Scottish National Investment Bank. Um, for those of you who, who, who don't know us, um, we are a newly created institution. Um, we launched in November last year, so um, very new. Um, and um, our primary focus is to deliver mission-led investment. Um, um, into a whole suite of projects um, which are consistent with the missions that the bank have been set. Um, we are, from a mission perspective, um, um, interested in uh, the transition to, to net zero. Um, we are also interested um, on, the, on place as an agenda. This is something that's um, a key priority for us. And we are also uh, incredibly focused in on mission impacts around um, new technology and innovation. These are three key areas that we feel that the bank can play a, a key role in delivering mission impact investment. Um, we are genuinely interested um, and key, keen to drive forward the, the environmental and social impacts that we can see from investment. And when we look at any project that comes our way, the initial focus of our discussions are around whether a project or a business has strong mission alignment between what they are trying to deliver and what we are trying to deliver from a from a bank perspective. And and to date, you know, we've been incredibly encouraged by the number of projects, businesses, propositions that are coming our way. Um, which have strong alignment with the with the missions that we are trying to to to, to deliver upon. Um, a key challenge for us going forward, particularly as a new institution, is how we measure and report back on that impact. Um, we don't want this just to be about narrative. Um, we want to genuinely see. Um, strong mission impacts on the investments that we that we make, um, and a, a key priority for us in the the, the coming months and, and the year ahead is how we build that out, um, ensuring that our external reporting that we are doing as a bank um, gives a clear indication of the the mission impacts that, that that we are seeing. So while we will undoubtedly be judged on the investments that we make. We're incredibly keen to ensure that we also deliver strong mission impacts, and that's a, a key priority for us. Excellent. Thank you, David. Um, it, it's interesting because that's uh, come out of some of the previous sessions in the conference here about some of the complexities of, of how do we measure impact in a way that is uh, um, sustainable, comparable, consistent, 
without it actually ending up being uh, too high level that it really doesn't uh, doesn't tell us anything so there's a there's a there's a lot of ground to be covered there and i think it's a challenge we all face as to you know wh what are the units of impact and how do you compare them and is there a common currency or you know how do we avoid it being purely narrative based and actually talk about actually real measurable things so a, a great challenge to, to be laid down there thank you very much for that david jane can i come to you next please Thanks, Bob. Um, and delighted to be involved in the session here today. Um, afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jane Stewart. I work with a portfolio of SMEs um, across environmental and technology sectors, as well as chairing the Circular Economy Investment Fund. So I come to the session today with a couple of different hats on. Um, the Circular Economy Investment Fund has been a, a grant uh, fund uh, run by Zero Waste Scotland um, with the RDF and Scottish Government uh, monies. Um, and I also work with the portfolio of, of SMEs from uh, Waste Data Analytics, a company called Topolytics, um, to a carbon efficient distillery project and IT services, but predominantly focus on businesses seeking to deliver um, environmental and, and social impact. Um, I come to the discussion today, therefore, from both an equity background, uh, a non-equity funding background and, and a corporate perspective. Um, and I guess I wanted to start today by, uh, by just giving an insight in terms of my uh, assessment of what impact investment means. Um, an impact investment Investors for me intentionally seek to achieve positive, measurable social and or econ environmental impact alongside a financial return and with a focus on the, the triple bottom line. I often use the BVCA categories in this regard. Um, they point to responsible investment as that which seeks to avoid harm and mitigate risks through consideration of ESG factors. Sustainable investment involving ESG factors to create value opportunities benefiting all stakeholders. Um, and impact driven investments going beyond that with a purpose and vision to contribute to solutions to societal challenges. Um, and I find that you know, in my own mind, quite a useful way to, to segment, you know, what, what do we mean by impact investing, recognising it means different things to, to different people. Um, impact investment has grown at significant pace in the UK and internationally in the last five to 10 years. When I began in equity investment, um, the term ethical investor was coming into use, although it tended to have a philanthropic tone uh, with an expectation of little, if any, financial return. In recent years, there's been really strong evidence of impact investments outstripping performance and financial returns, whilst also reducing harm to people and our environment whilst benefiting society as a whole. Um, every business and organisation I'm speaking to right now is new or established, is seeking in some way to understand or embrace the journey to net zero and beyond as we transition from the take, make and dispose society to a much more responsible model where our environmental impact is tracked and reduced, consumption is reduced and circular economy principles adopted to keep our um, finite material resources in use for longer. We must all embrace this journey to net zero collectively, collaboratively and individually. Um, and if we're serious about mitigating the impacts of climate change, I believe we have no choice. However, I believe that choice can be a positive one and impact investing has a really significant role to play in enabling and accelerating that choice. Through chairing the Circular Economy Investment Fund over the past 18 months, I've been in a privileged position to see a broad range of uh, propositions from SMEs and social enterprises uh, delivering significant carbon savings through innovation. Um, we have a rich tapestry of SMEs in Scotland and excellent examples of successful innovation with positive impact from Indigo Nature manufacturing fibre insulation from hemp crops to Kenotech manufacturing um, bricks from um, I think 90% construction waste um, and reusing that material um, and we've got other examples such as Seoda who are um, operating a, a rental model for um, for um, clothing um, and Topolytics, um, one of my own portfolio, um, a shameless plug there in waste data analytics. I believe, however, there is still a barrier to, in access to funds at early stages of innovation due to commercialisation. And that's for both startup entities and SMEs with limited resources seeking to embrace innovation to reduce climate change. 
Um, raising sufficient funds at the right time is a common barrier. And while Scotland benefits from one of the best angel investor communities globally and a growing landscape of EIS funds um, with an established investment community, I believe there remains an early stage funding gap which needs to be addressed to tackle the innovation and creativity required to substantially accelerate our climate change efforts. And for such funding um, not to be given in a way that constrains the, the development and the ability to leverage those entities. In addition, at both the UK and Scottish government level, I think much more needs to be done to ensure fair and equal access to funding to address the imbalance in financial investment and support for female and black and minority ethnic business leaders. Um, I think in terms of the challenges beyond that, I think measuring and managing impact we've talked about already, and I'm sure we'll talk more about today, um, and doing so with transparency, integrity and trust is really key um, to, uh, to ensuring the success of impact investing in the future. And equally, attracting, developing and retaining talent is an ongoing challenge for Scotland's creative and innovative impact businesses. Um, recently, we're seeing much greater workforce mobility and more international demand for the, uh, the bed of talent that we have here in Scotland. Um, countless studies equally are in increasingly indicating that employees um, have a key driver to work for businesses with genuine impact and ambition aligned with their values and which deliver environmental and social change, which I think creates opportunities for us whilst a potential threat to those organisations that aren't embracing such. Bob. Yeah, so so yeah, not a lot uh, to think about there then, Jane. Yeah, well done. Yeah, that kind of sets out a big, a big range of, of challenges there. Uh, a call for action the government. Interested, you talk about the, the early stage gap. Kerry and I have talked about this over the years. Bob and I have talked about this over the years as well as to um, there's plenty of sources of funding available at different parts of the journey, but are they available to everybody? And are they available at all the parts of the journey that stop the ideas, you know, moving forward? Perhaps Tom will have a view on that, given coming from the, the investment community when, when we come to Tom on that as well, because obviously the, the angel network in Scotland is now much more vibrant and complete than it was even, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and, and is doing a great job at certain parts of the journey for, for many of the companies. So excellent. Thank you for that, Jane. I really appreciate that. And I'd like to come now to, to, to Wendy, who's a, uh, uh, presumably in the same building somewhere, Wendy, but yeah, you're, uh, um, if you could share with us your view on this aspect here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Wendy Wu. I have a dual role with um, Edinburgh Napier University. I'm both lecturer of uh, entrepreneurship and uh, innovation with Business School and uh, business advisor for Bright Red Triangle um, Napier University-based uh, incubator. And my doctoral research focused on comparison study on impact investment models in Scotland, and I, that may be initiated um, Napier's Impact Investment Symposium. So um, the Impact Investment Symposium was launched in April 2020, um, but the preparation started a few years back. So what does the symposium do then? It's determined to be more than a safe space for debate. It aims to close gaps and break down the barriers for social change. So Symposium's passionate members are playing a key role in facilitating knowledge exchange while responding to some of the immediate challenges we face. So it's also playing an instrumental role in finding a route to success that will support economy recovery for all the communities. And um, Bob Hare and um, Alex Davis are both Symposium members. So, I mean, I've got three um, points uh, to share my reflection of, of this journey. So definitely um, having built up Memento is the biggest uh, achievement so far. We are launching social media campaign to reach out to a wider audience. We spread knowledge, share insight, identify best practice and promote collaboration and mindset change. So more than 90 members have joined us and established a five action group to progress specific projects. And we dive in for deep learning as well. So we have had lots of um, high quality speakers such as uh, Danny Sata from Issue Invest and Professor Alex Altman, who has done a lot of work on business case for purpose driven business. And as we said, today's topic is lip service or radical. We committed to action. We believe actions speak louder than words. We have learned from a successful model from the Australia New Forest about the government community private equity engagement model. So having applied this learning, one of our action groups has now submitted a funding proposal to maximize 
the benefit to the community from forest-related projects in Scotland using a method to aggregate community land so in both urban and, um, and rural location. So in terms of um, the, the landscape, as um, Alice Davis already picked upon, already made covered, there is a huge momentum, huge energy, and then the evolving um, new type of uh, investment appetite towards impact investment. So we witnessed the sector getting more uh, so sophisticated with growing knowledge and the growing expert. So the boundary between third sector and also private sector actually getting closer. So this leaves us a big emerging space to reshape common purpose, to reimagine future vision, and to reset the priority. And also in terms of um, the diversification of a product uh, um, is expanding as well. This is already shown from this venture adopting equity model. Uh, first of all, newly launched uh, catalyst fund using revenue-based model. Uh, big issue invest get themselves into the high street banking space, develop consumer-based product. Um, and in terms of collaboration effort, I mean, we started shifting from uncoordinated effort into the market space to grow and develop and shape the mar market. This is also evidenced from job title, we create the uh, social impact, uh, uh, the shape in the market job title as well. And um, also, Alistair Davis mentioned this in terms of policy and change and in terms of, in addition to mandatory and reporting requirements, for example, New method payment for success, government procurement, uh, and, and social impact, impact bond is all in place. So that's we witness the change. And um, what one challenge we would say in Scotland then, um, that's can demonstrate evidence from my doctoral research and uh, from the past um, more than 12 months um, engagement with the symposium, we confirmed now it's still the case. So for social ven uh, venture, the difficulties for them to accessing adequate money um, at startup stage. So barrier um, happen at both ends. So the lack of available money, and while there is a lot of good intention and then passion, but some project lack of um, sustainable business model. So the right support being given, and this can be fixed. Now, if we look into the funder's perspective, and then each funder scheme has their own application process, and the project can end up spending a lot of time looking for that support and navigating the different processes. But some ended up writing up more than 100 funding applications per year. So if more of this could be done through a single form and a central hub, it would make life much easier. I mean, if we bring funder and then um, the recipient together, so there is a lack of um, central place to provide um, data access. And so data are scattered and then poor quality and all over places. But what challenges us it's not the method to measure impact, but data gathering constraint from GDPR quality data. So research actually suggests there are more than 245 measurement frameworks. So it's very difficult for us to measure impact and both being reflected by Alex and Bob, Bob here. But it's real challenging, but once we can get better at quality, the problem can be solved. I would argue university will play a bigger role here in terms of contribute to quality data. So I think I will stop there and then um, pass on to Thank you. Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I mean, it, it, it is amazing when you lay it out like that, you know, the the number of different com complexity and issues we've got there. I, I was interested in from a, an early stage funding that the Net Zero Technology Centre up in the northeast of Scotland provides a slightly different model from others and it, it provides funding at an early stage to get people ready to actually seek investment and gives them money to actually live off during that time, which is an interesting concept. And it's diff it's not like um, funding that's available elsewhere. Maybe it's something that we can, we can take forward into, into the symposium, which leaves me with one panel member to come to. And, and Tom, you, you've been mentioned obliquely and indirectly already, but would you like to share your perspective on this world and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thank you very much, Bob. Um, Tom Croy, Investment Manager from Power Equity. Um, I'm probably going to have to rip up my script because most things have been, in some respects, uh, covered. And I would definitely support the comments from Kerry uh, as our Scottish Enterprise Investment Partner. Um, for those of you that don't know PAR, we're an investment management firm based in Edinburgh. We back the most innovative, high-growth technology companies in the north of the UK. And we also invest in commercial forestry assets, so two very different asset classes. Um, in terms of the, the venture capital side of ours business, um, we typically write checks of between one and three million pounds. 
um, into IP-rich hardware and software businesses that have shown early signs of commercial traction and have strong management teams. Currently got around 40 portfolio companies uh, spread across Scotland, the North of England and Northern Ireland. I think you are right, Bob, that there is a huge opportunity in terms of, uh, or a huge issue in terms of funding gaps. Um, and, and it'd be interesting to discuss the kind of below, the level below £500,000 and equally the Series A gap in Scotland, uh, probably at a separate date. But if we turn back to um, the subject in terms of paying lip service or radical change to impact investment, um, I think we uh, are certainly seeing uh, a growing um, interest in this area. I think it's been accelerated by the COVID pandemic. Um, lots of people are thinking about their, their place in the world and equally how their businesses interact um, with the wider stakeholder base. Um, but, but really, if we if we think about how we can progress forward, I think it's about knowing what good looks like for these early stage technology companies.